There's no doubt in my mind that if Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War was given an official English localization during its original release, it would be considered by public opinion one of the greatest games of all time today. The unparalleled storytelling, engaging gameplay, and massive scope would be right alongside the esteem of seminal classics such as The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, and Final Fantasy VII. Classics which would inevitably define the medium. Obviously, that reality never happened for Genealogy of the Holy War. But that doesn't diminish what an absolute treasure this game really is. If you're watching this video and you've never played Genealogy of the Holy War, I honestly envy you. Even more so if you've never played any Fire Emblem games at all. You, above all else, are in the best position to enjoy this game. Perhaps you've been dissuaded on yeeting into Yggdral for a myriad of reasons. Allow me to address the two most common excuses I've come across. Don't know how to emulate or patch a translated ROM. While I'm not advocating illegally downloading IP that you don't own, I will say that the user experience and options for emulation, regardless of OS, have taken leaps and bounds in the past five years. Starting up a gaming experience that was traditionally barred from us due to our physical locations is as simple as drag and drop. If you go into any Discord server filled with passionate enthusiasts like Mecha's Keep or my fan server and ask for help getting started, you will undoubtedly get a DM from a fan who will be jumping over themselves to give you everything you need to get started. The more the merrier. Or you could hypothetically just Google Genealogy of the Holy War Flash and be playing this game within 10 seconds from now. But don't. Watch the rest of this video, leave a comment, like, and subscribe! Hear that this game is pretty archaic and dated. I'm just going to wait for the inevitable remake. A remake of this game is not happening. How can I make such a clairvoyant statement? Well, because it's based on as much conjecture as claiming a remake is inevitable. I'm aware that the latest game, Three Houses, borrows heavily from genealogy, but so does every other entry in the series. I'm not sure why people speak as though Nintendo has already announced New Genealogy of the Holy War with optional funky mode and two seasons of disappointing prepaid DLC content. They haven't. And there is zero indication at the moment that they ever will. Nothing is outside the realm of possibility, of course. But by accepting this misnomer, you're denying yourself not only one of the most mechanically solid games ever, but also one of the most beginner-friendly entries in the series. Not even for its time, but today. This is a strategy game from the 90s and thus will obviously not have all the quality of life fixings that have developed in the past quarter of a century since this game's release. I think that's expected of any game that's been released earlier than this present moment. However, what it does give you is everything you need to have an enjoyable experience and fully entrench yourself in the grand scale and epic storytelling this game is known for. I went into this game not knowing anything about Fire Emblem or the mechanics specifically. It was a completely blind experience. And although there were some aspects of the game I discovered through trial and error, they were all the more rewarding because of it. This is the way I would recommend playing, honestly. The game is practically built around you discovering its nuances for yourself, and those discoveries and self-made strategies are all the more satisfying because they come from you. And in turn, they will create a narrative that is completely unique to yourself. But I realize that not everybody is like me. Unfortunately. And that's where this guide comes in! To maximize your potential enjoyment of this game, I'm gonna take you through all the mechanics you need to know, and nothing you don't. In doing so, I hope to provide beginners with the assurance and knowledge of how to utilize all the mechanics at their disposal without taking away from the discovery of a blind, self-made experience. And with that, folks, let's get right into it. When you start this game, the first thing you're going to want to do is save. Remember how I said that this game is one of the most beginner-friendly in the series? This is it, folks. At the start of each turn, you are allowed to save up to four individual files at a time. My preferred method for making the most use of this system is using the fourth slot as your first turn save for each chapter and not overwriting it until you successfully complete the map at hand. The next thing you're going to want to do is go into the option menu, and aside from moving the text and enemy speed to the fastest settings, you're going to want to set the auto save feature. This will make the game prompt you to save at the start of every turn. Notice by selecting file 1 as my auto save slot, the border around the slot has become gray. Every time the game auto saves, this slot will overwrite itself. So use the two remaining middle slots to manually bookmark whenever you see fit. The maps in this game aren't really meant to be tackled in one sitting. Pace yourself and take breaks if you feel the need to. Pushing LR, select, and start at the same time will soft reset the game. Keeping the start button held down during resetting or powering on will take you directly to the load screen. 
ensuring that returning to your game is as convenient as possible. Or if you're using an emulator, I don't see anything wrong with just utilizing save states. The fact that the game essentially lets you do this either way means that very little of the experience is actually lost. Now that we've got that safety net set up so that you can enjoy the experience without worrying about replaying large swaths of the entire map, let's talk about this map. It's big, there's lots of enemies on it, and it can understandably seem a little daunting at first, especially since the odds are currently 4 versus 32. But rest assured, there are several mechanics you can make use of that will sway the tide of battle to your side. And conveniently enough, we can start making use of these mechanics on the very first turn. The Weapons Triangle is one of the most powerful player tools in your arsenal. By entering combat with the proper matchup, you will gain a 20% boost towards the likelihood of your unit both hitting and evading the enemy. Every enemy with an axe, which is the vast majority of enemy composition on this map, has the Weapon Triangle disadvantage against your initial four starting sword users. You're also able to further boost your ally's potential to hit and evade by utilizing your leader's authority stars. The protagonist of this game, Sigurd, starts off with two authority stars, which grants an additional 10% boost to hit and evade to himself at all times, as well as any allies within three tiles of his position. Leveraging these two mechanics alone will assure that the odds are constantly in your favor. Stats are shown by hitting the X button on a unit. These seven numbers are a unit's base stats and the building blocks that determine their performance. However, the most important numbers are the cumulative stats found on top of the status screen. These are determined by combining both the unit's base stats along with whatever their equipped weapon is. Attack is the unit's base damage. It's their combined base strength with the might of their equipped weapon. The amount of damage dealt is this number, subtracted by either the target's defense or resistance. Range states whether the unit with their equipped weapon can attack adjacent, 1-1 range, 1 space away, 2-2 two, two range, or both, 1-2 range. You can also tell an enemy's attack range by seeing whether they have 1 or 2 red attack tiles surrounding their movement range. Hit is the base chance that the unit will connect their attack with the target. This number is then subtracted by the target's avoid along with other bonuses, like the weapon's triangle, authority, and terrain, to determine the likelihood of an attack connecting. Feel free to run these numbers before you run hands. Getting a good idea of what your unit's performance will be like before putting yourself into enemy range is always a great idea. When engaging an enemy on your player phase and selecting attack, you will see the battle forecast. The hit that's displayed already has all the field bonuses calculated into it. It's easy to see here how your setups can greatly affect the outcome of battle, from having a weapon typing disadvantage, to a weapon typing advantage, to authority support, to making use of terrain evade bonuses. Optimizing your setups and positioning is a cathartic and rewarding feeling. There is one last aspect of your units that we should address before we finally make our first move. Every unit has a set of skills that is viewable in the second page of their stat window. Skills help to further differentiate your units between each other. The skill that I would like to focus on specifically in this guide is Pursuit as it can be an incredibly powerful and reliable skill if you have a good understanding of how it activates. Pursuit's activation is determined by a unit's attack speed. Attack speed is your unit's speed minus the weight of their equipped weapon. If a unit has the pursuit skill and their attack speed is higher than the target, they will perform an additional attack at the end of battle. Unfortunately, attack speed is not displayed to the player in any menu and must be calculated manually. Understandably, it can be a little cumbersome if you want to know for sure if your unit is or isn't going to double their target. But honestly, most of the time it really isn't necessary. Typically, swords have anywhere between 3 to 6 weight, lances have 12 to 18 weight, and axes have 18 to 20 weight. So if you're going against an axe user with a sword and you have pursuit, it's pretty safe to say that you're going to be doubling them every time. But once again, it never hurts to run the numbers. If you have a feeling that things might be too close to call, just take a second to survey the outcome for yourself. It can be surprisingly fun and rewarding. At face value, it may seem as though units without pursuit are at a huge disadvantage due to not being able to follow up attack. But keep in mind, neither can 90% of the enemy units in this game. Allies in your army that don't have pursuit always have something else going for them that more or less will help them contribute to your army in a meaningful way. Whew. Now that was a whole lot of numbers. If you're feeling a bit overwhelmed by the hustle and bustle of second grade level math, don't worry about it. The numbers are just there to reward players who choose to utilize them. If you want to completely ignore them, go right ahead. I speak from first-hand experience that just by simply using the units, you'll get familiar enough with how they perform, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and what types of enemies they can and can't handle. 
It's honestly part of the beauty of this game, and Fire Emblem as a whole. I've organized all the information we've gone over so far in a handy quick reference sheet. Along with the descriptions of all the skills and their respective activation requirements, feel free to screenshot and share this image, or download the high-res version in the description. Use it at a glance while getting accustomed to the flow and mechanics of battle. Forward, the advice for the rest of this video is just that, advice. Please don't take it as anything more than my own subjective experience that's intended to help beginners appreciate this game. Okay, now let's start that EPIC! turn one gameplay that this channel is known for. Now, it's pretty clear that Sigurd here is gonna merc this axe brigand no problem. He has pursuit and will double the fool faster than you can say Squadron. You learn pretty quickly that Sigurd is a beast of a unit and will get you out of a lot of tough situations throughout the duration of this game, but I'm actually gonna take this opportunity to set up a kill for my boys Alec and Noish. Anyone in this game has the potential to become a great unit. It's just that some take a little more love than others. Instead of attacking with Sigurd, I'm gonna put him in range to provide authority to his allies. Unfortunately, in order for Alec and Noish to connect an attack on this turn, they have to be on a road tile, which penalizes their evade by 10%. Good thing Sigurd's authority completely mitigates that penalty. Alec doubles because of pursuit and dodges the enemy's counterattack. Noish comes in and checking the battle forecast, 21 attack minus 5 is 16. Wow, Alec and Noish output the perfect amount of damage to kill a single enemy. It's almost as if it were intentional. It's at this point you may notice one of your units is not like the others. When a unit is sans horsey or unmounted, it means two things. Their little legs can't go that far. Mounted units have 8 to 9 movement depending on their class, whereas unmounted units have between 5 to 7 movement. And second, they're not able to move after performing an action. This is known as Canto, and allows much more flexibility for mounted units with their setups. They can contribute to a battle and then advance past the enemy. They can perform an action, then withdraw for a more defensive position. They can initiate a battle in player phase with an effective weapon, and then equip another weapon after combat that may help them be more successful in the enemy phase. Unmounted units like Arden can't do any of that. Does that mean you shouldn't use any units without a horse? Hell no. You'll find that many units that don't have access to a mount still have very strong combat potential or other helpful utility in their own right. Prioritization and preemptive planning is a huge part of the overall strategy in this game. Villages can be saved from encroaching bandits and doing so will stop the depreciation of funds they reward, as well as giving you unique items that will help you on your journey. But if you're going to go out of your way for those side objectives, do it with units that have movement to spare. If you want your foot units to remain relevant without slowing down the pace of your gameplay, keep projecting them forward towards the main objective or even the potential next main objective. Committing them to a remote corner when you're inevitably always going to siege every castle on the map is probably a bad idea, especially if you want everyone to see their fair share of combat. If a foot unit is behind a mounted unit but is able to attack an enemy in range, you generally want to prioritize them over someone else who's mounted. Otherwise, the opportunities for them to contribute to a battle will be much more limited. Now, I understand that Arden doesn't exactly set the greatest precedent for unmounted units. For a first-time player, I would honestly advise keeping him in the guard position of your main castle for the entirety of the game. After all, if an enemy seizes your main castle, the game is over. And at base level, with the defense, evade, and renewal bonuses guarding a castle provides, Arden will buy you plenty of time or completely prevent an enemy siege if a stray unit makes a beeline for your castle. But for the sake of showcasing how to prioritize movement, I will be using him, making use of what little movement he has so that he does contribute in a meaningful way. Tap the R button. If it doesn't cycle to any units that still have a turn, then you can push A and end your player phase. As you continue throughout the chapter, new allies will join your army. Take a moment to go into the unit section of the main menu. This is a great way to get a global view of your units. You'll notice an arrow icon next to any units that are about to level up, so that you can consider prioritizing them in combat. Whenever you start a new chapter, your main lord seizes the castle, or a story event occurs, it's always a smart idea to check this menu and see who has access to the talk command. Talks are only available at specific points in the game. Using a unit's action to talk when the prompt is available is something you're going to want to do. They provide great characterization, story background, and sometimes even weapons and permanent stat boosts. On your way to seizing the first castle on the map, you'll hopefully visit the very most southern town before it becomes completely decimated after 10 turns. Doing so will reward the unit who visited this town with the Speed Ring, 
an item that will increase the speed stat of the holder by 5. Items and weapons are locked to the units who hold them. Later in the game, specific items held by enemies will be rewarded to the unit who lands the killing blow on them. While you will be able to trade weapons and items at a later point in the game with proper resource management, which one of your units will acquire and make use of them initially is definitely something you should consider and possibly plan a strategy around. Doing so will benefit you in both the short and long term. I think the acquisition of the speed ring provides an excellent opportunity to study the rationale behind similar scenarios you may encounter. Right off the bat, we can see that 5 speed is going to have a direct impact on a units of aid. A 10% boost to dodge enemy attacks is obviously going to benefit everyone in your army who sees combat. Quan has the skill Adept, which will increase the chance of him consecutively attacking twice by 5%. While this is a completely justified reason to give the ring to him, his attack speed is still going to be low enough to consider this added effect inconsistent at best. Plus, Quan already deals massive damage without having to rely on Adept, and is bulky enough to shake off multiple rounds of combat without evading. If you want to give this booster to a unit that can make use of it reliably outside of just evading, I would suggest considering any of your units with Pursuit. As the skill's activation is not random, it's based on your unit's attack speed being higher than the enemy's. More speed means more attack speed means more enemies you will double. Azel, while definitely in need of more evade against physical units, has the added luxury of being able to always exploit an enemy's weapon range. Fire tomes are pretty heavy, on par with lances, but once again, most enemies are wielding heavy as shit axes, and resistance against magical attacks is almost non-existent on brigands, meaning he'll do his job just fine without the need of extra speed. Madir has a cost, which does benefit slightly from the extra speed. However, just like Adept, its activation is very inconsistent. Being mounted in two ranged means most of the time, he should be initiating on enemies that can't hit him back and use his remaining movement to stay safe on the enemy phase. So that extra avoid is mostly not going to help him. Alec is a great contender for this ring, as it will allow him to equip lances so that he's never fighting against the weapons triangle, while still giving him enough speed to double most enemies. However, he's not going to be able to equip any other weapons till after this chapter, so it really isn't going to benefit him much at the moment. Finn, as I see it, is by far the best candidate for this item, as he has great base speed but is locked to a heavier weapon type. Giving him that extra boost is going to take him from doubling some of the units in the game to doubling most of them along with helping him contend with being on the losing side of the weapons triangle for the start of this game. Sigurd, if you haven't noticed, is doing just fine without any help. I'm gonna give the ring to Arden because I'm an adult and I can do whatever the fuck I want. Probably. With the boss murked, liberate the castle by placing Sigurd on the front gates and selecting the Seize command. After a castle has been sieged, a new objective will present itself. This is the formula for the entire game. You might want to use that knowledge and the survey of the map to preemptively set up your units for the next potential objective before seizing. Looks like Gerard and his band of rapscallions are rebuilding the bridge they just destroyed a few turns back for some reason, and are planning a full frontal attack orgy. And holy crap, this dude's got authority stars too! Hmm. If he wasn't guarding that castle and instead stayed in range of his squadron so that he would dramatically boost their hit and evade, it'd probably make it so much tougher to eliminate them all. Oh well, hopefully the enemy doesn't figure that out in later maps. In my next part of this guide, I'll be going over the aspects of the battle prep menu, or the My Castle in this game, which is accessed from the next chapter onwards. In the second half of this two-part guide, I will cover inventory, funds, and maximizing your unit's returns in the arena. Please look forward. Hey Fire Emblem! I like the things you do. Hey Fire Emblem! If I could, I would be you. I want to say thank you to everybody who helped me out, Mecha and Link King 7 for the feedback, always appreciate it, and and I definitely want to thank the patrons. Thank you guys so much for supporting this channel, trying to entertain you, placate you guys, um, and you guys give me the drive to keep on making videos. I really, 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 really appreciate it. And, um... Uh, I don't have anything else to say. Thank you so much. I can't wait for the next video. I guess there is one more thing I should say. Thanks again for joining me on another quest to discover the mysteries of the emblem. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And until next time, y'all, stay frothy.